everybody, and welcome to Open to Debate. I'm John Donvan with a debate in this one for those of you who may be fed up with America's two political party system and interested in thinking through whether there are really any better alternatives to that two party system. A key word in this one, duopoly, which is what you have when all power is concentrated between two players. And it's what we are said to have in the US, a two party duopoly where Power in elections and in governing goes either to Republicans or to Democrats and only extremely rarely to anybody else and never for very long. That's our status quo. And it gets blamed for a lot of bad things like gridlock and polarization and voter apathy and low turnout and cynicism and corruption. Now, whether it is fair and accurate to blame America's two-party system for all of that is debatable as is the idea that some people are proposing to challenge that status quo. And it's what we're gonna debate with this question. Does America need a third party? So let's get into it and meet our debaters, answering that the, arguing that the answer to that question is yes. He is the founder of the Forward Party and a former presidential candidate, Andrew Yang. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us at Open to Debate. It's great to be here, John. Thanks for having me. You set it up perfectly, made this whole list of things that a lot of Americans are very upset about. Okay, but we've got somebody to argue that those are not, that's actually not the case. And that is uh, going to be senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and political science professor at City College of New York, uh, Dan DeSalvo. Dan, you are answering no to the question, does America need a third party? And I want to welcome you as well to open to debate. Thanks, it's my pleasure to be with you. And before we get started, I, I would just like to get a sense of what motivates both of you to jump into this one. Um, Dan, I'll, I'll go to you first. You're an academic, you're a scholar. Um, why does this question get you excited? Well, um, a lot of my original scholarly research was on uh, political parties and the functioning of our two-party system. So this has been my sort of academic bread and butter for 20 years. And so I'm clearly interested in this topic and, and think it's powerful and important and interesting. And perhaps the question about third parties for 2024 is more salient perhaps than it has been in, in, in a good long while. All right, thank you. And, and Andrew, I'm gonna ask you the same question in a slightly different way. Um, as a founder of the of the Forward Party, and I'm saying a founder because you, you actually ended up aligning with other groups as well to form this party. Um, but my question slightly rephrasing for you is the fact that you have chosen to put your, your energies into politics, so much of them at this point. And why is that? What motivates you in that? Uh, well, I, I'm a parent, the son of immigrants. Uh, we can see that there are many thorny problems that are getting worse, not better in American life, problems that only a functional government could address. You could put climate change, immigration, response to AI, education, the list goes on and on. And so if you want us to make meaningful progress on these problems, you need a functional government. Uh, we don't have one. And we don't have one largely because of our current duopoly. So if you're uh, an entrepreneur and problem solver like myself, you say, well, how are we going to solve these problems? Well, All right. it turns out step one is to restore a functional government. All right. I didn't want to get you started into your argument yet. You just stepped into it. So let's move to that phase of the program and with our first round. Uh, and our first round will be opening statements. We want each of you to take a few minutes to explain why you are answering yes or answering no to the question of whether America needs a third party. And Andrew, you are up first for that. Again, you're answering yes to the question, does America need a third party? Tell us why. Uh, I am so pumped to be having this debate. And there are um, so many compelling <laughs> arguments about why we need a third party, some of which you, you laid out earlier, John. Um, but I'm going to stick to a, a, a few just off the top because we're going to get into many, many more. So number one, Americans want it. It turns out that surveys show 65% plus of Americans want another political alternative. And they just keep being told, why can't you have one? You can't have one because, uh, you know, because it's working so well. I mean, that's clearly not the case. Or else 65% of us wouldn't want this new choice in American life, one that doesn't hew to the uh, the wings, the extremes, the special interests that control so much of our politics today. Number two, uh, the current system's not working. And it was a U.S. senator who said this to me, a problem is now worth more to us unaddressed than addressed. Because if I don't solve it, I can get you mad, I can raise money, I get votes, my job is secure. What happens if I try and do something about it? My job security goes down, the base turns on me, I worked with the enemy, 
I'm ideologically impure, my 94% reelection rate might actually be threatened. And so that's why you have problems that are festering and getting worse in American life and Americans are giving up hope. You know why we're failing? Because of poor design that we have no choice but to amend and modernize for a modern time. And I'm going to, to present a third that may be salient in the near future that some Americans are concerned about creeping authoritarianism or autocracy. And you know what? Our two-party system is ideally designed to serve us up to an authoritarian regime. Because if you have a leader in this system, then everyone's incentives are to fall in line behind that leader. Uh, and then you can wind up with a very, very uh, uh, authoritarian regime just like that, which we can see. Now, if you had a more functional system, let's say there were even three political parties in American life and no one had a majority, then it would be very, very difficult for one individual to control both the executive branch and the legislative branch. If you had three or four independent, let's call it forward senators and 12 members of Congress, then if you had a, a president of a particular ilk, then they would not be able to take control of two branches of government, maybe three at this point, given what's been going on. So if you want to make something that's genuinely resistant to authoritarianism, you would want to amend and modernize the two-party system. Now, I can keep going, and I'm going to keep going, but at this point, I think I've already gone through my first few minutes, and I'm happy to, to uh, cede the time to Dan. All right. That's very gracious of you, Andrew Yang. Thanks very much. So, Dan, it's your turn now. Again, you are answering no to the question, does America need a third party? And here's your chance to tell us why. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I appreciate, you know, many of the points that, that Andrew made, but I, I think here, I think we really should be thinking about third parties in the context of the 2024 uh, presidential election. And that's probably what most people are thinking about. Oh, no, I, I just want to jump in here and say, let's take the 2024 presidential election off the table. Because well, I'd like I'd like to start with the 2024 presidential election, because that's what most people are thinking about for a third party. And I would say well, well, the, the I'm reason gonna... why I'm pushing back on this is that a Ford party is not actually involved. In, we, I guess we, I wasn't here Andrew, to I, the Andrew, I'm going to intervene. I'm, I'm going to intervene to to make clear that we're not asking you to make a, make statements on behalf of the forward party running a presidential candidate in this election because we know that the which, party which is not doing that. Which makes me fearful that Dan's going to spend time beating up a straw man. But uh, we're but not sure. Let's let's let him have his shot, please. Well, I think you know many people start about when they think about a third party and they think about the current the beginnings of the presidential campaign. They're thinking about a presidential a presidential election, and many third parties in American history have launched um, presidential candidates. So I would begin just at that point of the 2024 presidential election and a third party um, putting forward a candidate. Um, that's not to say anything about Andrew's party and its strategy or what what it wants to do. Um, but I would say, and I would grant a couple of points uh, initially that Andrew already made, which is a plurality, if not a majority of Americans are unenthusiastic about a Biden-Trump rematch, right? And in polls, they say they're very open to voting for a third party uh, candidate in, in the 2024 presidential election. Um, and I agree with Andrew, many Americans in polls say they're not pleased with our polarized political system uh, and party system today. Um, and I don't think that the Biden-Trump rematch is likely to generate um, a really coherent policy debate over the uh, problems facing the country, many of which Andrew mentioned. However, I would say that third parties, at least in presidential elections, um, don't win in our political system. And in fact, they don't often win even below the presidential level. Um, and that's not likely to be this case this time around. Um, and I can go through plenty of historical examples to make that case. Right. Most of the time, third parties at all levels, including the presidential election, really just act as spoilers by draining off votes from one side or the other um, and then undercutting that existing party. So we've only really had one successful third party in the entirety of American history to the extent that they entered, were able to displace an existing party. And that was the Republican Party in the 1860s, which entered the political fray um, in the 1850s and ultimately displaced the Whig Party. Um, I can go into, so in that sense, I think if uh, listeners are thinking about 2024, 
of certainly of a third party candidate or more third party candidates than putting forward the Green Party and the Libertarian Party, which are already considering putting forward candidates, are likely to probably act as spoilers and very likely to probably drain votes from President Biden, assuming he remains the Democratic Party's candidate, um, and if Trump is the candidate for the Republicans to aid Trump um, and probably perhaps help him win. And so in some ways, you can look at the data um, from the 2020 election, and it was in fact the smaller percentage of third party candidate votes that really helped Biden win in a lot of swing states. Um, I'm not sure a third party candidate in 2024 um, is going to really help the quality of the public debate um, about important uh, policy issues. None of the existing third party candidates uh, has, a, or third parties that are out there, whether this is Andrews, uh, a, a nascent political party or others, have really staked out cl really crystal clear policy positions. One remains to be seen what kind of positions uh, Cornell West might take with the Green Party, um, but I can't say that they're gonna uh, really improve the quality of the debate here. And ultimately, um, this desire for a third party is really just about a desire to have a different political system than the one we have. We have first past the post elections with single member districts. It's a very powerful setup to have a two party system but that two party system really allows for two big, really diverse political parties um, that does allow for a fair amount of choice and change. And there's probably more to be said on its behalf than is typically said. I just wanna clarify, Dan, did you say that this current system allows for a fair amount of choice and change? I did, yes. All right, I just wanna have that uh, uh, on the record, make sure that I heard you. So I wanna thank both of you for, uh, for your opening statements. And we're gonna come back in just a minute and get into a conversation, but I just wanna summarize what I'm hearing each of you saying. Andrew, I'm hearing you saying that yes, America needs a third party because the current system does, you're saying, lead to negative outcomes uh, such as cynicism, voter apathy, uh, corruption. Um, you also make the point that you, you're making the argument that the public wants it, that the public's been demanding this for quite a long time, which shows its dissatisfaction uh, with the status quo. You say our system at the moment is a result of poor design and it has the tendency, could have the tendency to lead to authoritarian regimes. And what I'm hearing from Dan is the argument uh, made that um, um, the case has been made many times before. He feels unpersuasively uh, that third parties really have a role to play in our system. The point that he just made, he feels the current system does actually allow for a good deal of uh, disagreement and change. Uh, and um, uh, he also makes the case that in his view, um, a third candidate at this time, or a third party, I think in general, he does, feels does not actually advance the public debate, and that these parties in the past have acted as, as roles that he defines as spoilers. So there's a lot for us to talk about uh, when we return, and we will be back to have a conversation about all of this right after this. Welcome back to Open to Debate. I'm John Donvan. We are debating the question, does America need a third party? We have Andrew Yang and Dan DeSilvo. And um, Andrew, I, I want to go to you First, for the the the, the point that uh, Dan made in his opening, uh, actually, one thing I want to clarify is that again, we we, we uh, uh, understood that you're coming on in this program not to argue that the party that you represent is making a case for a presidential candidate this year. I just want to make that clear that that's our understanding about what the terms of this your participation in the debate are, and we're absolutely comfortable I, but with I, that. But I think this is really, really instructive and helpful um, because here's the cultural programming that uh, Dan is echoing. Third parties are bad because, spoiler, Ralph Nader, Jill Stein, screw things up for the two parties in the next presidential election. Now, let's say hypothetically, which actually is reality, that you had a party, the forward party, that's saying, look, we're not getting involved in the presidential race. Then it turns out that 80% of the objections that folks like Dan have disappear. But the, these objections exist not because anyone cares about good governance or results or representing the American people. They just exist because the current establishment says, you know what, let's just pre-program all of the media punditry. Okay, with the, okay. The fact I, that I, 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 I have to, I have to, I have to jump in, Andrew, because I, I need to keep us on point. And I understand Please, that you feel that continue. that was on point. Um, so what I wanted to take to you is the question, he, he, uh, Dan made the point that, what those who are seeking a third party are asking for is not necessarily just a third party, but to change the system 
that we have that leads to two parties. And do you do you cop to that, or is is your goal also to change our electoral system? Well, you know, it, it was fascinating because Dan was making, in some ways, mechanical arguments that I agree with as a numbers person. He said, "Look, first past the post, single member districts tends to lead to to two party." Uh, uh, to, to a two-party system. Now, I want everyone in Amer watching this, everyone in America, not that everyone in America is going to watch this, but I want everyone in America to imagine a number that represents the approval rating for U.S. Congress as we're having this conversation. Think of a number. What do you think that number is? Dan knows that number. It's somewhere between 15 and 25 percent. Now, I want you to imagine a number that represents the re-election rate for incumbent members of Congress. Think of a number. I'm anchoring you high. It's even higher than you probably imagine. It's 94%. So you have a political system where four out of five Americans are unhappy with what is being delivered or not being delivered, but the incumbents have a re-election rate that is higher than the Jordan-era Chicago Bulls. Um, and so when someone says, hey, this is a great system for you getting choice and change, it's patently false by the numbers. The two okay, major Dan, parties Dan, have divided let, let the country into blue and red me, terms. Just, and Andrew, just in, Andrew, just in, just in, just, Andrew, just in fairness, just in fairness for the amounts of time people get to speak, I just want to jump in when you land a point like that and let Daniel respond to it. Yeah, I think Andrew's correct. Uh, there, we have a very high incumbency re-election rate. Congress as an institution is not popular, but individual members of Congress are actually quite popular with their constituents. Um, it's one of the paradoxes of our current political system. But I guess what I heard overall is that really the desire for a third party is really to have a different political system, a multi-party system um, that's much more common in Europe. But our current system is not set up to really permit that. Um, I think our two-party system, it's also important not simply to think about Congress and its polarized um, current instantiation, but to recall that at the state, state level, you have, again, named Republicans and Democrats across the country, but you really have a hundred different parties because the Democratic Party of Massachusetts is certainly not the same as the Democratic Party in Oklahoma. Um, and the De Republican Party of Utah is not the same as the Republican Party of New York. Um, so in that sense, when we talk about the U.S. two-party system, we're really talking about a system that's um, right. got a great deal of diversity inside these two larger parties. So, so Andrew, what I think I hear Daniel saying is that there, that there is a great deal of diversity within the party so that even with the incumbency factor, the, 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 the data that you uh, are citing, that that structure still contains a lot of diversity, that there are people from in both parties that represent very, very different points of view who have different periods of persuasiveness and a, a success in getting policies passed that they're behind. <laughs> to this, I, I, I would say just everyone, again, think about what's going on in their own state. Are you pumped about the points of view that are being expressed in your state? You're not. You know how I know this? It's because 75% of Americans live under what's called a trifecta of one party rule. If you are in New York or California or Massachusetts, Democrats effectively run the entire government. And that leaves anyone who has a different point of view on the outside looking in, including, by the way, most rank and file Democrats are not exactly excited about what's going on in those places. Uh, and then the reverse in a place like Texas or South Carolina or now, uh, you know, Missouri, whatever you want to say, is the reverse. So even the two party system functions as a one party system for three quarters of Americans. And if you were to go ask these Americans, hey, Dan, like, are there a hundred different parties representing all the diverse points of view? They would literally find that statement ridiculous. Dan? Well, I think, again, you can focus on the current party alignments of today, and Andrew's not wrong in pointing out that, that there is a lot of trifecta government today, but you have to look at the general historical sweep of the United States, and there's lots of change over the course of, a, the Amer of American states, if we're thinking just about the state governments and control of state governments by party. Um, over 200 years, there's been lots of change, and states that were heavily Republican at one point are now heavily Democratic, and vice versa, right? That's so. If you're just looking at a snapshot in time, things look frozen, and people are being totally un unrepresented. But that doesn't account for lots of historical change um, that we could expect to happen again in the future and over time. Dan, um, 
you, you've made the argument that third parties are spoilers, but third parties are put into the position of being spoilers because of the current structure, mm -hmm. which, so it, it seems to be a self fulfilling prophecy that third parties are going to be spoilers at best because of the existing structure. And I think Andrew's saying that that's a problem, that the existing structure stifles the, the, the ability of a third party truly to become viable in the sense of winning elections and getting a chance to govern in a meaningful way. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with that analysis, which is that the current system, first past the post, single member districts, the electoral college, all are important inst and powerful institutional factors that convert third parties largely into spoilers. So if listeners are thinking about the 2024 presidential election and they're not interested in uh, Mr. Trump being reelected president and they're concerned about some of the authoritarian tendencies that Andrew mentioned, then they should not want a third party to be on the stage. And that's an important point about evaluating the efficacy or value or merit of third parties in our current system. Now, if we want to expand the debate, which I, I gather that Andrew does, to an overall indictment of the U.S. political system as unrepresentative and poor, given these structures, well, then we well, could say, well, we should have a third, a, a multi-party system. I genuinely system thought that that was but, but Dan, we're, we're, We should all move to Dan, Denmark, <laughs> and that would be great. Um, Dan, hang on, let, let Andrew, can, let, let Andrew and, come in. Andrew wants, I think Andrew wants to take issue with something that you might have said. Go. No, go no, ahead. no, I don't. I mean, I, I agree with what Dan's, even Dan, it sounds like is conceding, like, look, if he had his druthers, uh, you wouldn't have this system. Um, oh I no! I, that's I'm what actually, I just heard Dan say. No, no I'm actually well, quite I, favorable to defending the the U.S. political system. So, um, as so Dan, a that means you, you, strong you, you and don't, solid you democracy. See, um, you don't see anything problematic with first past the post elections in which people with a plurality, with you know, with 32 percent, basically meaning that 68 percent of the population of the voting public did not want that candidate in, nevertheless gets to be the one. So it's a minority candidate. You don't see that as problematic. Look, every electoral system is going to have its problems, right? Even if you look at a multi-party plurality system, I, every I, I system know, I know, has its I know every, I know every system will have its so, downsides. So, I'm asking well, right. you if, so if, if you this is a downside. Point, right. Well, it certainly is a downside, but a two-party system also tends to favor majority elections, which is usually if you have two candidates, one's going to get more than 50% which is, you could say, better than um, many small parties acting as a huge drag in multi-party systems. You could look at Israel as an example of that problem today, small parties dragging uh, the major parties away from the political center, right? That's a multi-party system. Yeah, no, I, it I, has its downsides as well. So I, I, don't, I, I would love to, to, put, to put this a, a finer point on this. Um, so uh, I'm for something called ranked choice voting, which I hope most people watching this have at least heard of. And so ranked choice voting uh, ensures that the winner actually has majority support um, by, mm -hmm. by making it so that if you had more than two candidates, like Maine did when Paula Page ran for governor. So uh, to, to John's point, in that real life race, the governor of Maine was elected with less than 50% of the vote. People thought that was not what they wanted. And so they upgraded to ranked choice voting, which then allows different points of view to emerge and ensures that the winner gets majority support. So uh, one of the things that we champion is ranked choice voting, which would be a massive improvement. Um, and it sounds like John's asking, hey, Daniel, would you like to see our current voting system modernized to ranked choice voting? I like that question. Andrew, how about it, Daniel? I think there's many good parts of ranked choice voting. I think it's perhaps maybe a little bit, I don't want to go into a whole debate about ranked choice voting. I think it ha does have some virtues and should be experimented with and in states and localities such as they see fit. Um, I don't think that that ranked choice voting is a guaranteed um, royal road to a, th a third party or multi-party system in and of itself. Well, um, well, so it may, it, well so, what it would okay. do though, is that it would uh, completely ameliorate your concern, which is that if Cornell West uh, gets certain number of votes, then Cornell's voters can just rank Joe Biden number two, and then the spoiler effect disappears. 
true. That, that that might be true if we were to adopt it for presidential elections, which I think is a complete pipe dream. Um, now, at the same time, I would also say that without going to the technicalities of ranked choice voting, there is a lot of what are called wasted votes, which is, in a sense, people that do not rank any of the candidates that come in for winning, are, their votes are basically not counted. So the idea that ranked choice voting is vastly superior on its representativeness of the electorate's preferences, I don't think is borne out I, by I, it I in do need practice to push back or on in this theory. Because, because right now- Let's, let's take, the, uh, Andrew, the, uh, Andrew, most hang on of our votes second. are wasted. Just, Andrew, one I just second. want to say most Let, of our votes I, are wasted. I, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I just want to do a little bit of direction here. I, I want to give you a chance to respond to that, but I don't want us to go on and on about this sure. technicality. So go ahead, please, to respond, and then we'll move on. No, no, it, it's just that most of our votes are wasted and extraneous in a system where 94% of races are essentially predetermined for us, or you live in a, a state that you know is going to be dominated by one party, which is why so many Americans feel on the outside looking in. And if you had ranked choice voting, then even if you didn't represent 51%, of the vote in a particular race, people would actually court you because even your 10% might make a difference in a more dynamic race. It would allow new points of view to emerge. Right now, the, the current voting system is being used as a cudgel. And then anyone who wants to improve things is being told you're going to mess it up for whoever the, the less terrible option is. All right. Into a new direction now in this conversation. Andrew, I want you to talk to me about what what makes a third party a third party? So we have your party, we have libertarians, we have socialists, we have the Green Party. Um, we have a lot of parties here. What make what would make a party a third party? What's what 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 do you envision? That is the fun part of this, isn't it? So as we're having this conversation, I am the co-chair of the third biggest political party in the country by resources. After a year and change, we have 35 elected officials from mayors to state legislators who've already affiliated with the forward party. I believe we'll be well into the hundreds by next year, which will make us the single biggest independent political movement in over a generation. Now, uh, I love putting points in the board and one of the fun things, and this is one of the things that, um, that Dan will probably agree with, but that the popular debate completely misses. So everyone's fixated on the presidential. I get it. We all understand it. But there are 500,000 or so local races around the country, 70% of which are uncontested or uncompetitive in the current system because of what I've described. And tens of thousands of them are in nonpartisan roles, like county executives, the mayor of Fort Collins, Colorado. Are, 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 you, are, you, getting, are you getting to my question about what yeah, makes yeah. a third party a so, third party? So okay. imagine a third party movement, the forward party, that has hundreds of elected officials, mayors, county executives, school board members, state reps saying, you know what? I actually want to listen to the people I represent, not the party machine and what they tell me. Uh, and this is... 100% real. You can go to forwardparty.com, hundreds of thousands of members. And so I would say a third party should be measured by the impact it has on uh, real voters and constituents. And even as we're having this conversation now, tens, even hundreds of thousands of Americans live in communities where they're represented by a forward party elected official. So you, you, by third party, you mean basically then go from a two-party system to a three-party system, I think is what you're saying. And Daniel, I want to ask you, I know that you think that's unrealistic, Daniel, already, but if it could happen, if you don't mind doing the hypothetical. Well, uh, I just want what, to say everything I just said is 100% real and is not hypothetical, but continue. Uh, Daniel, uh, we don't, don't have a, I, I would I would dispute the fact that right now we're in a three party system, but that's that's uh, your right to say that, Andrew, and to believe that. But Daniel, I want to ask you to respond on the premise that we're not yet in a three party system here. Um, wh yeah, what would you I see as the outcome? I think you know, um, without debating the merits of, uh, of of Andrew's party's enterprise, um, it's, it's not uncommon at all in American political history and political life for there to be third parties that are relatively successful in state and local elections, especially local elections um, in, mm -hmm. in municipalities throughout the country. Um, that's persisted. The Green Party has been, you know, fairly influential in California, for example, over time. So th there's nothing really new there. Um, you know, it's also a little like talking about the, the UK, which is a, largely a two-party system, but occasionally has a a third party that has a presence in parliament. So in these local elections, for a while, you have some of these third party candidates. But ultimately, many of the structural factors that 
uh, encourage our two-party system, reassert themselves, and, and these parties, after some success, sort of fade from the scene. So it's so a, a, a fine a, thing, but it's not, you know, yeah, that's, that's not going to change the political system in some radical that's what way. I, that's what, what I want to take to Andrew with this notion of whether there's a third party. Andrew, would you foresee, I mean, would your ideal vision for your party or any third party, uh, theoretically, in this conversation, to that, that, that there be three viable parties? Or would your goal be to knock out one of the existing parties and be the new party in a two-party system? Like most Americans, uh, I want a functional political system that actually listens to me uh, and my family members and community members. I talked to a political scientist named Lee Drutman, who Dan probably knows, uh, and I asked him, how many political parties do you think would be ideal in the United States? I'm going to rewind for a second. Um, our, sure. If you look at the Constitution, there's not a single word about the Democratic Party or Republican Party because our founding fathers did not like political parties. George Washington warned against them on the way out. John Adams said two parties would be a great evil across the land. James Madison said you can't have factions that don't shift. So our, our founding fathers did not design this political system. And if they woke up, they would say, wow, you guys are actually living our worst nightmare come to life. Uh, when Dan talks about the changes that have gone on over the last number of years in our political system, you know what's happened? the polarization of the two major parties, where the Democrat and Republican parties were not this uh, off on the edges uh, 25, 30 years ago. But now we all know what it is. It's uh, urban versus rural. It's uh, more educated versus less educated. It's diverse versus more homo homogeneous. And so how does, do, does this polarization reverse itself? The answer is it doesn't. The answer is it gets worse. Media is going to compound it. Social media is compounding it. So we're heading off into our corners with no end in sight. And you know what the end naturally is? Civil strife and conflict. Civil War 2.0. That is where we wind up. And when Dan talks about the last time a Republican, the Republican Party dislodged the Whigs, you know when that was? 1860. Abraham Lincoln wins with 39% of the vote in a four-party race. So if you ask me, what is a functional political system look like in the United States of America, the worst possible number of parties you can have is one. The second worst is two. The third worst is three. The fourth worst is four. You see where I'm going. The ideal number of political parties in the United States is probably somewhere between three and six. And if you have that number of functional political parties, you actually have a resilient system that will not succumb to authoritarianism as easily as this decrepit, dysfunctional two-party system that we are riding into oblivion. Dan, we're coming up to a break. Do you have 45 seconds to respond to that? Well, again, I think Andrew's just making clear that ultimately this is about, you know, having a different political system almost entirely. Um, with, because only such a completely different political system that would probably have a parliament rather than a Congress that would get rid of bicameralism uh, in our current framework would allow for three to six parties to exist. I, 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 I don't see him stage. going. I don't see him going that far in terms of radical change to the structure. I guess what, I, what no, I just heard I, I was the will, will, optimal will. outcome was three to six parties. And to get a six party system like Spain or France um, or you know, Denmark, you really need to have a parliamentary system with uh, proportional representation in elections, not first past the post single member districts and a bicameral legislature. So uh, really to get the outcome. Andrew, I, wanna, I, wanna, I just want to check in with you. Are you really a big, a huge change? Well, so uh, first, let me say that there's actually a bill in Congress called the Fair Representation Act that would shift to multi-member district. So Dan is not entirely wrong that I would like to see our system uh, advance and evolve, but it's not some airy fairy hypothetical. There's like a bill in Congress and a lot of very smart people in Dan's field are begging us to head in that direction. They're also begging us to grow the number of members of Congress because back when Congress was inaugurated, like you represented 80,000 people. What is it now? Like uh, 10 times that number. But I'm going to point out what Americans watching this already know. The current Democratic Party should be two separate parties. We all know what I'm talking about. The current Republican Party should be two separate parties. Then maybe there's one party in the middle. Let's call it the forward party for fun. Um, then you're at five. That is a logical system that actually represents where many Americans are and would result in much, much better outcomes. And oh, by the way, would protect us against authoritarianism. Um, so 
I want to make clear then, uh, Andrew, do you feel the space for the third party that would become viable, whether yours is or anybody else's, would be in the center? That that's the that's the opening. Um, well, there is an opening a mile wide there because uh, right now, so here's the biggest myth in American life, and I think Dan will bear this out. The biggest myth in American life is that our leaders have to make 51% of us happy. Not true. 94% uh, of our leaders only have to make 10 or 11% of us happy because that's who's voting in the primaries. So because you have these wings that are controlling our national politics, you have 65, 70% of Americans in the middle who are looking up saying, I don't recognize what you guys are talking about. Like, uh, you know, I, I just want things to work better. I just want my kids to actually go to a school that's functioning and safe and like, you know, my parents not be scared to go on the street. So that's where most Americans actually are, but our politics does not reflect that one bit. And so that's where the opening is, yes. Daniel, and I mean, another group that is aiming for the center or says that it's aiming for the center is the political organization, No Labels. And No Labels uh, started uh, back in 2010, I believe, uh, claiming that they were sort of solution oriented and wanted to, to defeat polarization. They are putting up, are, are attempting to put up a presidential candidate in 2024. They've uh, qualified in at least 10 states at this point, and they're being severely bashed, particularly by the Democratic Party. What does that tell you? Well, it tells you the Democrats are clearly concerned that a no labels candidate trying to put forward a candidate that would be sort of centrist or uh, moderate um, would drain votes off from President Biden and act as a spoiler, as I suggested, which is why I think the third party question for most Americans is one that comes up with presidential elections and most saliently here for 2024. I realize Andrew would like to avoid that. I guess what I would also say about um, this, these centrist or so-called centrist or moderate um, third party openings, I think there's probably less space there than meets the eye. Um, if you look at no labels policy platform, and certainly the policy platform of the forward party, um, they don't really have one. Um, the, and one thing about a political party is that usually people think that it stands for something, it has an agenda or set of issues that it wants to accomplish. Um, but in the case of no labels, their policy platform is mostly vagaries and pieties to which everyone almost agrees, but no brass tacks things. The forward party, I think it's kind of creative, um, has explicitly said we have no agenda and we'll just do whatever people running in different is mm. districts want to do. So it's a party that wants to be a party without being a party in the yeah. sense of having an agenda. Um, Andrew, so I think um, there's less Andrew, space there for these, these centrist parties um, than meets the eye. Andrew, what lesson do you take from the experience that No Labels is having right now? Well, you know, I, I think it speaks to, again, um, the anxiety uh, among the current establishment that if people have a genuine choice, they're not actually going to choose <laughs> the, the, the major party candidates. It's like, you know, I mean, like, so in, in the two party systems view of the world, we're all perfectly happy because we're all so well represented by the D and the R. Um, but then it's like, no, 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 wait, if you actually have someone else, then people might vote for them. So we have to prevent that from happening. But that wouldn't be a concern if you were actually being represented. So it, it's a bit of a, like, a, like, a you know, catch 22 self fulfilling prophecy that they found themselves in the only way out, in my view, is to just step up and say, all right, look, guys, it is true that our current democratic system does not represent people awfully well. And instead of trying to stifle competition everywhere we can, we're going to implement a more modern system that hinges on ranked choice voting, maybe even multi-member districts, and give rise to actual true representation that will stand the test of time instead of clinging to a dysfunctional system that will serve us to a very, very bad regime in the not so distant future. All right, we are coming up to a break. When we come back, we're going to bring in some uh, expert journalists who've been covering this topic uh, for some questions and answers to our debaters. The question we're looking at is, does America need a third party? And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Open to Debate. I'm John Donvan. I am joined by Andrew Yang and Dan DeSalvo. We're debating this question, does America need a third party? So now we're going to bring in some other voices, uh, very respected members of the press who uh, who, who cover uh, politics and have been looking at these questions. Um, and uh, we're gonna have them go uh, one by one. I wanna start first with uh, Gideon Litchfield. He um, is the outgoing global editor in chief of Wired. Um, he has been uh, 
looking at the future of democracy and most recently pivoting to the impact of tech and artificial intelligence on it. So that brings a, a very, very contemporary, up-to-date and topically relevant uh, spin on, on how um, Gideon is looking at politics. But Gideon, thanks so much for joining us at Open to Debate and uh, come on in with your question, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Hello, Andrew and Daniel. I'm going to ask a, um, a disappointingly non-tech focused question, though. Um, <laughs> Jamel Bowie wrote a, a year ago in The Times when the Ford Party was launched that um, third parties have succeeded most in the US when they're focused on a very clear and even polarizing policy position that they succeed in getting one of the two main parties to adopt. And he cites the anti-slavery Free Soil Party in the 1840s. Uh, and Daniel, I, I think you sort of tilted at this when you said that the two-party system is actually flexible and allows for change. I think you were suggesting that it can absorb new ideas that, that are brought in from outside. Um, so Jamal Bowie argues in this piece that the Ford Party, as Daniel said, doesn't really have a clear platform other than people are sick of the two-party system and we need electoral reforms. So my I have a question for each of you. My question to Andrew is, what do you say to this argument that you don't have a policy platform? What do you stand for? How would you get people to vote for you when you don't have clear positions on climate, on the economy, on healthcare, and so on? And then Daniel, given how tribal politics has become today and how there isn't really political debate anymore, as far as I can tell, what do you think would be an issue that a third party like Andrews could adopt that would make inroads? What, he, what should he be campaigning? Um, Andrew, take that one first, the, please. Of course. Thank you for the question, Gideon. So here's the game that uh, the two-party system would love us to play and associated media organizations. What are you really? Uh, in other words, if you are a third party, um, you have to be either left or right or Democrat or Republican. So I'm going to keep pressing until I find what you are, and then we can put you in a bucket and ignore you. You can then fight it out within that party, but half the country will, uh, you'll be completely a non-factor to two-party system wins, America loses. The forward party stands for a very simple representation, which is that our leaders should do what the communities that they represent actually want. Um, if you look at a Princeton study, you know what the relationship is between what Americans want and what we're getting? There is no relationship because we have a fake democracy that has divvied up uh, us up into blue and red zones and then pat us on the head and said, you no longer matter because we're going to pretend that all of you are the same in this community, even though that's patently false and untrue. So the forward party uh, has said, you know what, we're actually going to give voice to what people want in their communities. And the exciting thing is that when I sat with a mayor in Colorado, um, who has not yet publicly joined the forward party, but I expect will, he actually asked me, okay, what is the litmus test? What is it that you want me to cop to? And then when we said, uh, working with people you might disagree with, grace and tolerance, solving problems, listening to evidence, respecting election results and the rule of law, he said, that's it, sign me up. And that's one way that we already have so many wins across the country uh, because we're actually going to give rise to what Americans want. Um, if you try and take a stance and in ideological terms in this system, then the two-party system wins. And believe it or not, people, I care about the folks in Massachusetts and Mississippi. I refuse to, to write off half the country, which is exactly what the two-party system has done. Gideon, I, I, I want to let you back in to follow up with Andrew, if you want to, before we get to your question with Daniel, if you if you have the urge, because if you don't, I do want to. Um, no, I, I let, I mean, my, my only re response to that would be, it seems like saying, do what Americans want, but not offer, not tell them what you'd be willing to do in response to their demands, Leave, leaves leaves you open to that that same charge that you nobody knows what you stand for, and so they won't vote for you. Well, but I, well, I want to know what Daniel has to say. The fun thing, Gideon, is, is we have a system right now that's giving virtually none of us what we want. You know, I mean, really think about it. Like, think about the thing you're passionate about. And then is the system actually delivering to you what you're but that's, passionate but about? That's, but, but Andrew, that's not, a, that's, not a, that's not a response to, to Gideon's challenge that, that the other guys are not doing it well either. He's, he's, no, I think his challenge right is- Right now they... we're being manipulated and set up, being separated into ideological camps when none of us will actually achieve those goals because the system is designed not to give any of us meaningful results. But ultimately choices have to be made in terms of policy. And people yeah, would want to we'll, know- we'll actually let the American people make that choice instead of uh, trying to you know, tribalize everyone. 
I think the right, challenge so the is question... how you would convince people that you are going to give them what they want when the other two parties are not. Like, what, what's your credibility there? But I'd like to hear that. That is the challenge, Gideon. That is exactly right. And that is the case we have to make to folks around the country. But that's right. So, Daniel, um, Gideon's other question is, what, what do you think a third party, I don't think we need to make this about Andrew's party necessarily, because we've been trying to stay away from that. Although, Andrew, you've been making a lot of political speeches I've been letting you get away with. So, um, uh, I didn't think we they were political it. speeches. I apologize. <laughs> you've been making a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of promotional speeches. Let me put it that way. And you don't need to apologize. Um, Daniel, what would be an issue that could, uh, I think uh, Gideon's uh, uh, sense of it is that could motivate and energize and define a third party in a meaningful enough way to make it successful in terms of elections and potentially governance? Well, I guess my position in this and role in this debate is not to be advocating on behalf of uh, third parties or giving them ideas uh, to create their success. So the question is um, a, a little bit, I think, putting me in the position of then defending or giving fodder to. Um, I, I meant it more party. on the premise that there are only going to be two parties. What would be a wedge issue, if you like, or a, a, a point that a third party could adopt that one of the other two parties might say, all right, that's actually a good one for us to take on? Yeah, I think, you know, if you look, I, I like that you cited uh, the Jabal Mui piece in the New York Times, which I thought was quite thoughtful and historically well informed as, as much of his stuff is. And I think here the problem is I don't see one of these big cleave, national cleavage issues, an issue like slavery, an issue like um, free silver in the late 19th century, which animated the Populist Party um, as a wedge issue and helped it, in, in a sense, you could say, reform and remake the Democratic Party uh, under the under the guise of uh, William Jennings Bryan. So we I don't see a national issue that hasn't partly been addressed. You could think about, you mentioned climate change, but you could say one, of, what's one, of, the, one of the signature uh, successes of what you could say is the moderate uh, centrist Biden administration is the Inflation Reduction Act um, and a number of other uh, climate related initiatives um, that have just passed. I don't see where new labels or these other third parties are saying we have a different position on what should be done on climate change um, than the Biden administration that's going to be something uh, radically different that's going to be a centrist one anyway. I could imagine from you could say the socialist left something much more statist and um, that would try to animate climate change as a centrist issue, but I just don't see that. I think the bigger thing here is to go back to something on, on Andrew's point, which is that Andrew has really been made over and over, which is this denunciation of the United States government is completely unrepresentative um, and basically terrible. Um, and I think there's obviously for politicians and party activists running against Washington is the oldest strategy in the book. But I think there's much more to be said on behalf of the United States and behalf of the, much of its policymaking record, which is fairly representative, you know, and does often do perhaps slowly, perhaps grudgingly, um, maybe not as quickly as everyone would like, but it does sort of get there over time. Um, and there's a, a certain impatience today, you could say, that wants to have a third party or wants to reform the political system. But I think the United States government is much more responsive and delivers better, not to say that it's not without lots and lots of problems, but those are problems that slowly and incrementally, it, it's certainly in comparative perspective to other European nations um, or other rich I, nations around the world does okay. I, I have to jump. I have well. to jump in because, in the in the interest of time, and Gideon, I want to thank you so much for uh, for bringing something new to the conversation. Thank, thank you, you for that. Um, our next uh, journalist joining the conversation, staff writer at the New Yorker, Sue Halpern, who, by the way, uh, recently wrote the piece "What Is No Labels Trying to Do," uh, and I recommend it. But Sue, thanks for joining us at Open to Debate. And what's your question? Um, hi there. Uh, good to see both of you. Um, I agree with Andrew about ranked choice voting. I think if we're going to have multi parties, then that's the way to go. Um, we already have third parties. So one thing I don't understand, I think, from Andrew is, are you saying we should have a third party and that we should be breaking up uh, party affiliations essentially into thirds? I mean, how, how does the third party work? Uh, in that duopoly. And, and secondly, the thing I don't really understand at all is, is when you're talking about changing party structure, you're not really talking about structural change in the United States. So you talk, Andrew, about uh, 
the incumbency issue. Um, why do we have an incumbency issue? Um, let's talk about money and politics. What's to say that a third party won't suffer the same uh, debilities that we're seeing in, in a two-party system? So uh, that's a question to Andrew and- uh, So I, I, I love your thanks. line of questioning. Um, uh, I, so I think money in politics is noxious and getting it out uh, is necessary. Um, I'm going to throw something in the mix that educated people may differ on, um, but 74% of Americans are for term limits for members of Congress. Um, there's an entire anti-corruption uh, message and platform that most Americans instinctively embrace and agree with. Um, now, when you talk about what we can actually get done, I'm glad you like ranked choice voting. Um, I think if we had ranked choice voting, the incentives would be dramatically better. And then some of my concerns um, might actually be lower. You could get rid of the spoiler effect. You'd have people actually have to get my majority support. Um, now, the way this could look in the United States of America, so the forward party, 35 affiliated uh, legislators after, let's call it a year, um, we think we'll be at several hundred uh, by next year. And how, how many U.S. senators would it take to change national politics? Uh, in the current system, uh, one, two, max three. Uh, and a guy named Evan McMullen ran for Congress uh, for Senate as an independent, fell seven points short of Mike Lee. Um, but you have more and more independents in America who are self-identified, 49%. So you can see, even in this system that right now does not want a new entrant, you can imagine a new entrant actually getting hundreds, even thousands of mayors and locally elected officials around the country. In Pennsylvania and Arizona, we have about half a dozen state legislators who've aligned with Ford. And in 50, 50 states, what percentage of state legislators would you need to change the agenda? Probably about 5%. This is one of the great things about what we're doing with Ford is we don't need 51% of Americans. So I'd love it. So if you want to sign up, go to forwardparty.com. Um, but if we get five to Here's 10%- that promotion again, come on. <laughs> but if we get five to 10%, we can change- the, the way of life for people in states uh, around the country and maybe the entire country, in part because no one loves what's going on right now, Sue. I mean, two thirds of Americans want something very different than what they're getting. That's probably low. It's more like 75%. Although, although you know, when you look at those polls and uh, what you find is if you say to a Democrat, uh, you know, do you don't like the system? They say no. And then you say, will you vote for Joe Biden today versus, you know, someone else? They say yes, like 80% of them, 80% of Democrats will still vote for the Democrat and 80% of the, or even maybe more of the Republicans would vote for Trump. Um, so, I mean, you have to parse those, those polls a little differently, I think. Um, and also most independents, even though they say they're independent, have a kind of intrinsic affiliation with a party. They don't necessarily, you know, so, go wandering so, here, out. Here's the, the comparison. Sue, Sue and Andrew, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, I, this I have, is the comparison. I have, and this, I, I have to right, break in because of time and we need to get to our third uh, thank you, Sue. questioner. Thanks very much. And thank you, Sue. Our third questioner comes from Real Clear Politics, Eric Felton. He's an investigative correspondent there. Eric, thanks for your patience and come on in. And what's your question? Um, Dan, first, my first question is for Dan. And, and it's really... What what is a political party for? What is a political party about? And the the ex, an example I would give to think about is, um, you know, political parties do the nuts and bolts of, you know, getting people on the ballot. And a lot of times the um, uh, candidates who kind of come out of nowhere um, stumble when it comes to getting on the ballot in all fifty states. And that's because there isn't a party there. Eric, I, and I apologize, Eric, but because of time, I have to limit you to that one question. Is that the one you want to go with? Sure. And it sounds fine to me. Sure. And that's a question to Dan. Yeah, just to be brief, I mean, what is a political party? Huge subject of debate among political scientists. But I think, Eric, your question in some ways contains the answer, which is it's a mediating institution um, between voters and government. It's meant to connect voters to government, and it's meant to be a vehicle for uh, people who want to run for office and who want to 
make change in American society, um, to get on the ballot, to do all those nuts and bolts things, and to advocate for specific positions um, that they hold and they think are the wise course of action. Um, and it's and finally, you could say it's meant to help organize government, organize legislatures. That's what uh, political parties often do. So really those those three things. Andrew, would you like to uh, also define what is a party? I'll I think it's a really great question. On, on, I'll defer to the expert uh, on that. Sounds good to me. <laughs> All right. Uh, Eric, thanks very much for, uh, for, sure. for your question to us. Um, we have one question that's shown up in the chat that I think we might just be able to squeeze in. Um, it's often claimed, this is from Megan Richards, it's often claimed that the primary races dominate the system and limit possible results. Would eliminating primaries or changing the way they operate help? Again, uh, I can give each of you 30 seconds on this. And Dan, if you wanna go first, I know that- um, uh, no, Let me lead off with this one. Um, Megan, this is the central mission- Wait, 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 Andrew. The, I, I, Andrew no, no, I, no, just- Andrew, I'm no, no, Andrew, I'm yes. the moderator. I'm the All moderator. Right. So Daniel, please take the question. <laughs> Um, okay, th thank you very much, John. Um, I think there's many th cases to be made of reforming our primary system. Uh, there's a case to be made eliminating primaries. I don't think that we would want to do, but I do think primaries are indicative of a point I made earlier in our discussion, which is the amount of choice and change, which is look at the Democratic presidential primary in which Andrew participated. Look at the recent Republican presidential primaries. We're talking 15, 16 candidates. Um, that's giving a lot of diversity of views of giving people a lot of choice inside what is a very large party. Um, we might want to reduce the amount of time for our primary season and the cost, which goes to some issues about campaign finance. Um, but I would say our primary system is very open and does show the diversity inside our parties. Okay. Oh man, we, we need to also. we need to get rid of party primaries as fast as possible. We got rid of them in Alaska in 2020. We saw immediate results. Uh, Sarah Palin out. Kelly Shabaka out, Lisa Murkowski back in, even though she voted to impeach Donald Trump at a cost of $6 million evergreen. If we got rid of our party primaries, the fiction that our leaders have to listen to 51% of us might actually become reality. There are ballot initiatives to make this happen in Nevada and Arizona in 2024. Let's get it done. If we don't get rid of the party primaries, we will continue to be held hostage by parties that do not represent us. What would you the replace least. the? Who, you know, how, is, you know, how are you going to select candidates then? Uh, hey, Daniel, just look at what they did in Alaska. They said everyone can run. You can vote for anyone you'd like. The top four get through to the general chosen via ranked choice voting. Voila. Okay, everyone so likes that it. is actually everyone is happy, right? Well, that's an interesting reform because that's actually to try and eliminate political parties entirely. So that would be well. It's getting it's getting hot here. It's getting hot here. Just as we need to move into our closing <laughs> round, and so we're going to go. Fifty-three uh, percent of Nevadans with, voted for the closing thing We're going to bring this home with closing. This is we're what Americans want. Come on, Andrew. We're going to bring this home with closing remarks. Andrew, you do have the floor. You get the uh, the first crack at the uh, closing statement. Again, uh, you're answering yes. America does need a third party. One more time to tell us why. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, John. Uh, you know, it's almost like being back on the presidential debate stage. I'm kidding. This is much, even, this is much, much better. So, uh, so uh, we can all see that we're not heading in a positive direction right now. And when, when Daniel talks about, hey, our government is working okay in terms of response, how long has it taken our government to respond to the arrival of social media? Hint, they never did. And that's one reason why we are now seeing our public consciousness fragmented into a thousand or a million silos. How long will it take our government to get AI right? What's your confidence level on that? What's your confidence on immigration? What's your confidence on uh, any of the major issues of the day? Your confidence level is low because you are awake. You are sentient. You are looking around. And we're at an era where we cannot wait for 25 years in the vain hopes that our leaders get it right. You know why our hopes are vain is because they do not have to get it right in this system. Again, 94% incumbent reelection rate. The biggest mistake they can make is actually trying to do something or running afoul of their base or dying. Those are the only ways you lose office in this system. So why would they do the right thing by us? Why would they in the face of the billions of dollars that flood our system and have them all handcuffed and then in the hopes they can like get out and, and get a, a cushy job afterwards, like that is not going to fix the problems are getting worse, not better. What will fix it? You know, I'm going to say we're not quite sure, 
But what has the best chance is if millions of Americans stand up and say, okay, I get it. I'm being played, I'm being manipulated, I'm being turned against my fellow American. And if enough of us come together, we can free ourselves from the yoke of a system that does not care one whit about us or our families. This is the only way out. Thank you. You hit time perfectly. I just want to point out on that. Uh, Dan, you have mm -hmm. the last word in this. One more time, you are answering no to the question, does America need a third party? One last chance to tell us why. Well, I think the, our debate and discussion has gone much beyond just that question um, to really this broader question of does America need a multi-party system and to be dramatically overhauled. And perhaps the overhaul will come from some spontaneous awakening that just Andrew just mentioned of millions of Americans all of a sudden demanding reform. I guess for my part, I think that uh, that's unlikely to occur. I think that our current system has many defects, but maintains many virtues as well, including our two-party system. Um, third parties will likely continue to flourish at the state and local level in American politics. Third parties will probably emerge in the future in presidential elections. They will have many of the effects that people don't like, serving as spoilers, Ralph Nader helping to elect Bush in 2000, Jill Stein helping to elect Trump in 2016. So, those are gonna be permanent features likely of our system going forward. If we focus the question narrowly on should a third party be launching presidential candidates or alternative parties be launching presidential candidates in 2024, it probably depends on your politics. If you're a supporter of President Biden, you probably think not. If you're a supporter of President, uh, former President Trump, you probably think no label should definitely put up uh, a candidate um, and it'll help President, uh, former President Trump win re-election. Um, so on that score, I think this, the debate has really gone on to this broader question of, you know, is American government functional? I think to put, Andrew has a very high standard of evaluating whether American government is performing well. But I think if we look at it compared to what? Compared to an idealistic standard that Andrew is describing or compared to standards of other democracies around the world? And I would say the United States doesn't fare so badly if we look at those international comparisons. Thank you very much, Dan. And I just want to say to both of you, Andrew and Dan, thank you so much for taking part in this program from Open to the Debate. Um, the two of you proved that we can do what we set out to do with this program, which is to show that people can disagree with one another in a civil way that sheds light. Uh, both of you did that with, you know, just hit the, those notes perfectly for us. And we really, really appreciate the energy uh, and also the decency that you brought to this uh, conversation and this debate. I also want to thank our journalists, uh, Sue and Gideon and Eric, for bringing the conversation into even uh, more interesting uh, taking it in even even more interesting directions. And that does conclude our debate. And I want to thank our audience for contributing uh, your, your time uh, and for being able to uh, actually bring one of your questions also into the program and thanking everybody for tuning into this episode of Open to Debate. You know, as a nonprofit, our work to combat extreme polarization through civil and respectful debate is generously funded by listeners like you and by the Rosencrantz Foundation and by supporters of Open to Debate. Open to Debate is also made possible by a generous grant from the Laura and Gary Lauder Venture Philanthropy Fund. Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman. Clea Connor is our CEO. Leah Matha is our chief content officer. Alexis Pangrazi, Kristen Muller, and Marlette Sandoval, our editorial producers. Gabriella Mayer is our editorial and research manager. Andrew Lipson is head of production. Max Fulton is our production coordinator. Damon Whittemore is our engineer. Gabrielle Ionicelli is our social media and digital platforms coordinator. Raven Baker is events and operations manager. Rachel Kemp is our chief of staff. Our theme music is by Alex Clement. And I'm your host, John Donvan. We'll see you next time.